Good evening, everyone. Our first speaker is Ryan Nishiyama. He's been an avid fish keeper since the age of 10. He has kept a number of aquariums of all sizes and a wide variety of freshwater fish. Through trial and error and a whole lot of dead fish, Ryan has become a master fish keeper and he hopes to expand his collection of freshwater fish. Please welcome Ryan to the stage. Winston Churchill once said, diversity is the one true thing we all have in common. Therefore, celebrate it every day. Today, I'm not talking about your traditional understanding of diversity. I will not be talking about racial, religious, or cultural diversity. Instead, I will be talking about a different type of diversity, one that applies to all of us. This diversity has existed long before human society, and in that time, each group has learned to coexist and thrive together. And this type of diversity happens to be in the fish tank. Now, you're probably wondering how much diversity exists in a fish tank. Well, the underwater happens to be home to over 10 million marine species. And with all that biodiversity, there, becomes, there comes a lot of diversity of characters. Today, I'll be talking about the different characters found underwater and how you and I might share some similarities with fish. In our first group, we have the outgoing type. If you are someone who likes the limelight or identifies as an extrovert, then you might share similarities with the centerpiece fish. These fish tend to stay at the top of the tank and receive all the attention due to their beautiful colors and elegant swimming. Like human, these fish excel at being leaders and decision makers, but they can also be aggressive and controlling. Some famous examples of this personality include Darth Vader, John F. Kennedy, and Donald Trump. Second, we have the followers. If you are someone who likes hanging out with friends or works well in a team, then you might be a schooling fish. These fish are always found in groups and their pack mentality prevents attacks from bigger fish. Schooling fish are known for their strong bond and teamwork, but their lack of independence and inability to lead are the greatest weaknesses. Some famous examples of this personality include Kamala Harris, William Shakespeare, Atticus Finch, and Elsa. Third, we have the introverts. If you are someone who prefers to be alone most of the time, then you share similarities with the cave-dwelling introverts of the aquarium. These fish, or crustaceans, don't like the light or attention, and you'll find them hiding in caves and not interacting with other fish. Just like human introverts, they struggle with confidence and social anxiety, but they are observant and tend to be great thinkers, which is valued in the tank and human society. Some famous introverts include Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Batman, and Kobe Bryant. Finally, we have the contrarians. If you are someone who hates rules and don't care what other people think, then you might, be, you might share some similarities with the oddball fish of the tank. They're the lone wolves, and they, are they aren't contrained to a particular level of the tank. Contrarians are independent and free-spirited, and they offer unique perspectives on certain issues. However, contrarian personalities can be difficult to work with because they are known to clash with others for the sake of being unique. Some famous contrarians include Mark Twain, Kanye West, and Michael Scott. After hearing all these personalities, you might be wondering where your personality fits in all, into all of this. <coughs> well, according to corresponding Meyer Briggs personalities, about 17% of the world would identify with centerpiece fish, 50% as a schooling fish, 11% as introverts, and 22% of contrarians. Whatever fish you identify with, each one serves a purpose in the aquarium community. Therefore, having a balance of each role is important for the balance of the ecosystem, and we humans can certainly learn from this. We humans all have our strengths and weaknesses, and there are, there are occasions where our strengths shine, and other times where our weaknesses get the best of us. When that happens, we rely on the strengths of others to help us overcome our weaknesses. Therefore, it is important to have diversity in our society because if we work together, we can use our strengths and weaknesses to overcome any social issue. So whatever type of or personality you have, just remember the fish keeper put you in the tank for a reason. So be yourself and respect others. Thank you. Hello, Hello again. Jimmy is currently a sophomore studying communications, legal institutions, economics, and government, or better known as CLEC. 
in the School of Public Affairs. After graduating American University, he hopes to get involved in public service. Outside of school, he enjoys watching and playing sports. Please give a warm welcome to Jim. Save a life after yours. Department of Motor Vehicles. This spring, I went to the DMV to get my license renewed. I'm sure many of you have done that as well, or you're waiting for the summer whenever your next time is to get it renewed. When you get there, I think we all can agree that the DMV is very long. It's frustrating. The people there aren't particularly nice. And if you're unfortunate enough, you might have forgot some of the important materials that you need to begin with. Either way, eventually you make your way up to the window and the first question, at least in Pennsylvania, looks something like this. Here, you quickly write your name, your first and last name, your telephone number, and your email address. And you do it quickly because the person's giving you a weird look and you just want to get out of there. The second question that you might see looks something like this. And it seems almost as insignificant as the question before. Pennsylvania strongly supports organ and tissue donation because of its life-saving and life-enhancing opportunities. And in these handful of seconds, they fail to mention that over 100,000 Americans are on the organ transplant list right now. That's the equivalent of two and a half Washington National Stadiums. They fail to mention over 6,000 Americans die every year waiting for an organ transplant. That's a number a little bit smaller than American University's undergraduate class. And in 2020, 5,994 people died while waiting for an organ transplant. Included in that number is my own dad. These are not just numbers. These are people. The United States leads the world in organ donations, which is great, but supply is not meeting demand. What policies can our government create? Can we ask our representatives to create to change this? One, opt-out system. Research has shown that this system could increase organ donations rates compared or increase organ donations rates compared to the United States current opt-in system. The opt-out system is simple. Everyone's an organ donor unless you go to the DMV and check that you don't want to be one. The second system that increases organ donation rates compared to the United States is priority rule. If you're an organ donor and there comes a time you need an organ, you get to hop the list and you have priority over people that don't, that are not organ donors. And if you use both these systems combined, research has indicated that it would increase organ donation rate by 45.5% compared to the United States world leading opt-in system. Now this is a lot. It's a lot to ask you guys to go to your representatives and ask for these policies. And even if you did, in the 117th Congress, only one piece of organ um, legislation got passed in the law, and that was a tax credit for stem cell research, which has nothing to do with what I just proposed. But there is something you can do. And if you could, reach into your pocket and pull out your wallet. There you can look at your license. And when you look at your license, if you could please look toward the bottom and see if you have that organ donor designation. If you do, I applaud you. And if you don't, you have a very unique opportunity the next time you go to the DMV and they ask you that very significant question and you have the opportunity to take one small step, check yes to be an organ donor and change the lives of over 100,000 families. This doesn't just apply to my issue of organ donation. This could apply to anything in life where sometimes it might seem incredibly daunting and all you have to do is take one step to change the lives of so many. Thank you. Hello again. Our next speaker is Annabella Torres. She's a 19-year-old sophomore here at American University. Her passion for communicating with people led her to major in public relations and strategic communications and minor in the Spanish language. Although she currently calls Long Island, New York her home, she has family all over the world, which has inspired her love of travel and learning about other cultures. Please join me in welcoming Annabella to the stage. This is a picture of my grandpa and my first cousin. And this is another one of my first cousins. And this is another one. We're twins, right? When I was growing up, the different appearances of the people in my family 
wasn't really something that I thought about. I thought about what they wanted me to think about, where I came from, my family's history, what spices to use when I'm cooking, how to be respectful, responsible, strong. My family taught me to be proud of my heritage. They taught me to feel safe and happy, but most importantly, they made me feel like I belonged. It really wasn't until I got to college that my identity came into question because it was the first time in my life that I was surrounded by people who had no idea who I was. I was starting from scratch and I had to prove who I was to the world. I'm Irish, Pakistani, and Puerto Rican. My DNA is filled with diversity, but you would never know it. At first glance, you'd have me pegged as your average white girl. And there's nothing wrong with being white. But when all it takes is one look to strip you of every ounce of the rich culture that you grew up enveloped in, it makes you feel like nothing. It's important to understand that the color of my skin is not the problem here. The assumptive and exclusionary culture of our society is. I don't pretend that my darker skin family members have it easier than I do. If anything, it makes their lives more difficult. The problem is the judgment that people so casually pass off onto you because you don't fit their description of what they think you should look like. The problem for most multi-ethnic people is the idea that we don't fit into any single category. We feel like we belong to too many categories and that because of this, no one ethnic group will ever truly accept us unconditionally. We feel marginal in every cultural setting feeling like we're able to relate and wanting to belong, but always being reminded that a part of us is different by a society that deems us too white to be ethnic or too ethnic to be white. But what if we all collectively decided to shift our perspective? What if multi-ethnic experiences were seen as advantageous instead? In a study done by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Multi-ethnic participants reportedly view their identity as a strength. They believe that being multi-ethnic changes their perception of the human race as a whole because it gives them a more pluralistic view. They know what it looks like to be discriminatory as well as discriminated against, which can lead to solutions for related problems. When we view ethnicity this way, it becomes a superpower. It becomes a cognitive trait, something that's tangible. It reminds us that our ethnicity is who we are because we're still using our ethnic experiences regardless of whether other people can see it or not. Ethnicity is invisible, but it's always present. It's a part of how we're raised and it impacts what we believe and why we believe those things. It's a powerful tool in understanding how other people walk through life. But we can only use this tool if we take everything we think we know and throw it out the door. Because our assumptions mean nothing against a life of lived experience. Amanda Boston is an up and coming philosophy and communication specialist focusing on global philosophy and culture as well as international public relations. Aside from being busy in the classroom, she is also a varsity athlete on the American University swimming and diving team. She hopes to travel to 50 countries by the time she's 30, but if she's ambitious enough to do it by 25, that would be great. Her favorite thing to do is meet people, especially in Central Park, on the street, or in line at the women's restroom. Please give a round of applause for Amanda. Before you eat with your mouth, you eat with your eyes. This is a quote that I heard on a cooking show, but this speech today is not about food. I remember looking at the common room in eighth grade and seeing everybody around me in the same clothes. Everybody had Adidas Superstar shoes, black leggings, and a Brandy Melville top, and you had a bonus point if you had that one with the alien on it. And then I looked down at myself and I realized I'm in that same exact uniform. You're at that age in middle school that all you wanna do is fit in. And one of the ways you do that is by dressing like everybody else. I grew up in New York City, which is one of the most diverse cities in the country in the entire world. However, I grew up 
and very sheltered. Everybody around me was just like I was. Everybody who I went to school with lived the same life that I did. And when you live in that, you are locked inside a bubble. How do you know any different when you have nothing to compare in this world? How do you see difference when not everybody is different? I got to school still in that uniform when I went to high school. And I remember looking around at me and everybody had a different personal style to street style, to designer, to thrifted. Everything was different. You don't see that uniform. I looked down at myself and I'm like, this sucks. I'm not in middle school anymore. Why am I wearing this? I've always had an eye for color, yet I'm not using it. If I know I could do more, why am I not doing more? So that second semester of freshman year, I started wearing a bit less polished. I had a t-shirt. I would always tie it around the front and wear a belt, wear jeans, and then wear combat boots. And at that time, I thought I looked cool, but I still wasn't there yet. One time, I went to H&M, and I was just browsing around, and I came across this orange sweater. And I looked at it, I'm like, this, this is something that I've never seen before. So I impulsively bought the sweater. I went back home and it was the first thing that I tried on. And I looked at it and I was horrified. Oh my God, what did I buy? This is, this is so bright. This is so out there. How could I wear this? And I looked in the mirror. I was so intimidated and my walls were teal. It was bouncing off the orange. Oh my God. And I took it right off and I stuffed it in my closet. When I was in the fall of eighth grade, I mean, 10th grade, I was looking through my closet and I was cold and all my sweaters were in the laundry. And so I reluctantly took out that orange sweater. It was clunky, I felt the texture, it was heavy, but I was cold and I needed something to wear. And so I put on that sweater and I slept nice and sound. And next morning I woke up and I was still so comfy at work throughout the entire day. And I even went outside in that sweater, still a bit self-conscious to dinner with my family. And I remember they mentioned it to me, Amanda, where did you get that sweater? And I said, Oh, I, I just got it a little while ago and it's nothing. And they said, oh, okay. And so we went on with dinner. And as dinner progressed, I got less and less subconscious. I went back to the, my room and I smiled at myself that night. So the next couple of weeks, I, I knew I had an event coming up where I was seeing a bunch of people from my middle school. And so I took the chunkiest jeans that I got and this big textured orange sweater and I put it on. I wore shoes that were not Adidas superstars and I walked outside my apartment and I walked onto the subway and I got some looks because I'm wearing a bright orange traffic cone of a sweater. I get to school and I get compliments from teachers. And that night I get compliments from people who I went to middle school with. And all of a sudden that self-consciousness that I felt about wearing that bright color evaporated. Personal style to me is not seeing and copying a look. That is the definition of what not to do. You see a look and you put your own spin on it. And I think that that orange sweater was my first step in looking at my personal style and putting my own spin on something. Something that you wear should have an invisible imprint of your name on it so that if it's taken off your body and somebody looks at that outfit, they're like, yeah, that is something Amanda would wear. But this confidence is something that you need to edge into, just like I did. So you buy something, you try it on, and then you try it on for a longer period of time. You wear it around friends and family, and then you wear it outside. Because confidence is something, a look. It is something that you have inside of you, and it's something that you present as a person. And that did not stop with the orange sweater for me. I started buying holographic makeup and I started buying makeup with colors and matching it to what I wear. I'm wearing glasses right now, but I'm wearing orange eyeliner and I'm wearing an orange dress to represent the orange sweater that I wore in 10th grade and I bought. And when you feel more confident when you present yourself with how you look, everything's gonna change. How you, how you stand, how people approach you. People are gonna look at you and be like, I wanna be that friend. But I know that that orange sweater was my start and it's definitely not my end. Personal style is not static. Your confidence is not static. Everything changes based on where you are, your environment, your culture, your country, and how you feel. So while not everybody's gonna get their orange sweater, I bet in each and every one of your closets, you have that piece that you're not that confident to wearing. But if you try out these steps, I know you can walk out there and everybody will look at you and compliment you and you will feel so good about yourself. Thank you.
Kevin Wu is a junior in the School of Communications, majoring in Public Relations and Strategic Communications, minoring in Business Analytics. She is also an international student from China who has lived in D.C. for the past two years. Unfortunately, due to COVID, Kevin has yet been able to travel back to China, but she hopes to return this summer. Everyone, please welcome Kevin. So I know you must have heard of Chinese New Year before. What is the first things coming to your mind about this special festival? It's like Xin Nian Kuai Le or Gong Xi Fa Cai, like the blessing word people sing in that day to their friend and family. Chinese New Year also called Spring Festival. It's the beginning of the New Year on the traditional Luna Solar Chinese calendar, and it is the most important traditional festival in China. It dates back thousands of years, representing the beginning of the new year and end of the last year. At this moment, we have some special food on the table, like lava congeny and rice cake, dumplings, dumpling, soup dumpling, and spring rolls. All those things while on the table when you have the dinner with your family. This is what looked like in the New Year Eve's um, on my family dinner. And also even my pets, she have a new haircut <laughs> for the new year. Well, like everyone, when everyone enjoyed the wonderful festival, I used to hate this complicated custom so much. And let me, sh that is the video, I can show you how complex, how complicated it is. As you can see in the video, the custom of the Chinese New Year does not start at the first day of the new Lunar New Year. It's beginning like the 10 days before the New Year. And you have to clear up your house, make some food. Every children in there, families is asked to help and go to help their adults to do to do the housework. At the New Year's Eve, you couldn't go to bed until the next day come. It's called Shou Sui. It's a custom of blessing. It's really hard for me when I was a child, like stay whole night and not go to sleep. And that's haven't done yet. What I hate most, most, and the most is when you have the you have to follow your parents to visit your other family members on the first day in the new year. That is a relationship map for the Chinese relatives. Chinese people do not address their elder by their first name directly. Usually for children, it's important to call your elder by the name of your relationship with them. Don't be shocked, that is a real map. Like we have those so many people here and they have all the different names about your relationship. That is my family from the side of my dad's family. I can't name all the people in this picture, but I also have another big group of people from my mom's family. That is make me crazy. During the new year, elder will give a home ball that is like a red envelope are open sought to warn of the evil spirit and bless their children. During the Chinese New Year, like people give their kids, but people's behavior right now is really twisted when they act. Chinese people are too modest, as you know. Parents will teach our kids do not accept uh, do not accept the home ball from their relatives. However, the fact is, after pushing back, you will still need to ask, accept the home ball. 
and you have to count the amount quietly when no one is around you. And you have to make sure your parent can give the same amount, give back to their children. This is what this looks like. You see, they finally picked the home ball. <laughs> and <laughs> however, the fact is after, <laughs> That is just a, a tip of iceberg. There are so many annoying things in the whole break. Like, does someone else know this one? The Mahjong, like a Chinese traditional board game. And adults are playing those games day by day. And they just ask their child to go somewhere else and play. But they are the biggest annoy in the room. Also, because everyone took the break. So if you go to the restaurant to have dinner. The food is really, really bad. Yeah, I can promise it's really bad. So when I first, when I left home, came to America, I was glad that I finally didn't have to go through that again. But sooner I found out this, this does not go the way I thought. I'm start missing those complicated customs and lack of those loud fire quickers and annoying relatives seems to make me feel a little lonely during the Chinese New Year. So I found that when I was going through all those annoying things, I was enjoying the atmosphere of being together with my family. I finally realized that I miss my family. And that is another thing we do every year in the Chinese New Year. We took a family picture together and this one is when I was two, and this one is when I was 13. And this one is they took last year, but I'm not I'm not with them. So they left a place for me. <laughs> that is. So that is how a lot of times happen. When people lost before, they know how to cherish. <laughs> but uh, but fortunately, but fortunately, COVID is over. So I will back to China see my family in the summer. Thank you. Next, we have Josie Vaughn Fisher. She has spent years perfecting her scheduling and to-do lists. Through different styles of planners, notebooks, to-do apps, digital calendars, and more, she has learned the secret to getting done everything you want to do. Unfortunately, no amount of planning can help her with watering plants on time. But if you want to learn other tips and tricks, please give a big round of applause for Josie. Time is money. We use this phrase most often when we feel short on time. But if we really feel that way, why don't we budget our time the way we do our money? I have struggled to feel in control of my time and my to-dos, and it makes me feel like I'm not in control of my own life. Viewing time as a resource has changed that. Let's take a look at a few of the benefits that I have noticed. Budgeting your time helps you to be intentional because you choose what you're doing at any given point of the day. You choose what you're working on and where you are when you're doing that. And it helps you to be more grounded in the everyday moment. It also helps you to do more because intentionality helps you make the best use of your time. You become more efficient. Minutes aren't suddenly slipping away where you don't know what has happened. You know exactly what you're doing at any given moment during that day. Budgeting your time can also help you to achieve your goals. By assigning time slots to goals, it helps with your follow through. So instead of saying, oh, I want to run more, you can say, I want to run on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m and take a guess about which world you're gonna be running more in. This can also help you feel in control. And to feel in control, I have found that adding something that I like to call active relaxation to my schedule has become most significant. Because when you set a time aside specifically for you to do nothing, to not be productive, to watch TV or scroll on your phone, whatever you need to do to unwind, 
you find yourself significantly more relaxed because you know you're not missing out on anything when you're sitting there watching your TV show. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing in that moment. And you don't have to worry about everything else you need to get done because you know exactly when those things are gonna be completed. 30 to 45 minute time blocks puts you in the five, top 5% five most productive people. You setting aside tasks during those chunks of time, 30 to 45 minutes, or I stretch to an hour, lets you become one of the most top 5% of productive people. That's pretty fantastic. A Forbes study also found through interviews of the 200 most successful individuals, this includes everyone from CEOs to Olympians, that the one thing these individuals had in common was that they time blocked a form of budgeting your time. Let's take a look at how exactly time blocking can work. When I like to budget my time, I start by adding my commitments. These are things where I know I need to be in a certain place at a certain time. Then I add my habits and my to-dos. So for example, I start with when I'm waking up and when I'm planning to go to bed. I add in a space for my morning routine and my evening routine. And then I add in any forms of transportation I might need to do. So if I know I need 30 minutes to get from home to campus, that 30 minutes is gonna be happening from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Then I start adding my to-dos. When I'm gonna be doing my paper, when I'm gonna be doing my readings, roughly how long I expect to be working on these items. But most importantly, you should always be over budgeting how long it's gonna be taking you. Because like with money, we don't wanna fall behind. We wanna make sure that we're using less than we had intended to. It can also stave off some anxiety in, at, and avoid the risk of falling behind on your schedule. Then you add in your goals, going to the gym in the mornings, doing that reading hour before bed that you always hope to get in. Altogether, being intentional, being confident with your ability to follow through on your schedule, being forgiving, knowing that sometimes you will make mistakes, and just like we all accidentally buy the coffee we didn't need, you're gonna spend a couple of extra minutes sitting on your phone when you didn't intend to. But that's okay. It takes a time to discover what works best for you. And most importantly, you should experiment in order to find the best way for you to budget your time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are our final speaker for the night. This is Callaway. She's from North Carolina, majoring in public relations and minoring in international studies. She struggled with insomnia for years, so her project is going to be about sleep. Please give a warm round of applause for Callaway. Thank you. College is known for a lot of things. It's known for early mornings, back when you didn't know not to take 8 a.m.s, or for late nights in the library, pulling an all-nighter before your big exam. It's known for staying out late with friends, partying, or at a club, and 3 a.m. fast food milkshakes. But what college is not known for is a good night's sleep. Many people, especially college students, don't know to treat their sleep like an important aspect of physical and mental health, and when they do so, their bodies suffer. Sleep is linked to every one of our body's natural functions. So when we neglect our sleep, we're neg neglecting those functions as well. While one bad night of sleep is not a risk for your long-term health, Yale Medicine has linked even one night of poor sleep to um, negative effects in your attention, your memory, and your emotions. John Hopkins Medicine has also linked chronic sleep deprivation to uh, increased likelihood of health risks in the future, including dementia, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and certain type of cancers, including colon, prostate, and ovarian. Thankfully, we can actually identify a lot of the factors that keep us from sleeping at night. The University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has very conveniently listed the 10 most common factors that keep us from sleeping at night. So the first thing is eating or drinking alcohol right before you go to bed. These things often make us feel really tired and sleepy in the moment, 
But once you're asleep, it really affects the quality of your circadian rhythms and often wakes you up frequently. Your environment also plays a really big factor in the quality of your sleep. If you're finding your room is a little too hot or a little too cold, chances are it's gonna wake you up in the night. If you have artificial lights going in your room, either leading up to when you go to bed or when you're actually sleeping, it's going to affect your sleep. Uh, this is most prevalent with blue lights, which is the light emitted from screens, such as this one. Um, we really have to watch this in our cell phones and our computers, which I know is sometimes hard for college students, which is why I would very much recommend an investment in blue light glasses. They have worked wonders for me. Finally, your schedule can greatly impact the quality of your sleep. Waking up at erratic times and Waking up and going to bed at erratic times, drinking caffeine late in the afternoon, exercising before you go to bed, all of these really disrupt the natural rhythm of your body, and then that is therefore going to disrupt your sleep cycle. Now, I'm not gonna dump all of these potential triggers to sleep deprivation without providing you with a few solutions to help you sleep better. So the CDC recommends, first and foremost, consistency in your routines. Find a time that works for you to go to bed and wake up and apply that time every single day, even on the weekends. Even though it's gonna be really challenging at first, once you implement this routine and you're consistently meeting those times, it's not going to affect your health as much if you need to miss it one day because you're going out with friends or you're going on a vacation. Um, living a generally healthy lifestyle is also really important. You're gonna see that in all aspects of your health, but especially sleep. This includes drinking water, eating well-rounded meals, and exercising. Although, as I said, keep that before noon, preferably. As college students, I am not gonna tell you to sacrifice your social or your academic lives because of a super strict sleep regimen. I still stay up super late during finals week. I still go out with my friends on the weekends. But healthy sleep starts with strong habits, and I really hope that you are all encouraged to go out and start building those habits. Thank you.